What I'm going to do this evening is talk through the uh, uh, toolkit that we're lucky enough to have shared between all of the Cambridge area repair cafes, um, thanks to the generosity of uh, Draper Tools and Mackay's in Cambridge. <clears throat> um, uh, I should explain that uh, the uh, assortment of tools in the toolbox probably isn't the same as you would have at home, um, and uh, this is uh, uh, entirely rational because it's based on our experience of repairing about a thousand household items in the repair cafes and every time somebody has said wouldn't it be great if we had a such and such in the toolkit then we, we've gone out and, uh, and acquired it uh, and uh, as a result we, we're now up to about a hundred kilograms uh, and I'm sure that on this uh, um, event uh, you'll probably suggest a few more and say well you really ought to have a such and such uh, and maybe it'll get to be more than 100 kilograms. Also, you'll find that there are things which aren't in the toolkit that uh, you would probably take for granted that you would have at home, simply because uh, those uh, requirements have never arisen. Um, on uh, the, the slide, which I think Simon's going to put up in a moment, um, you can see the mix of things we've had to repair. <clears throat> um, uh, and this has very much driven the choice of uh, not only the tools that we have in the toolkit, um, but also uh, we, we found that certain spare parts were needed again and again and again and were industry standard, uh, and so it made sense to include those as well. Although obviously it's not possible to include spares for, for everything. Yeah, just, just pin, the, pin the view. We're, we're not sharing a screen yet. Okay, yeah? Um, so anyway, um, uh, let's, let's go through and, and, and talk through <clears throat> the things which are in the toolkit. Um, I've uh, divided them up, very roughly speaking, into things for diagnosing issues, um, things for doing cleaning, things for applying force in various ways, mechanical force, um, and, and then various specialist tools that we have. Um, uh, and finally, um, a list of consumables and uh, spare parts uh, that uh, are there. Um, uh, I, actually, one of the things which we didn't do, Simon, was talk about how we we're going to show the, the set of boxes, but um, maybe we can do that later. Uh, there are um, a, a number of boxes that um, won't really be part of this because they contain administrative things which are really useful for running a repair cafe but uh, not so exciting for, 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 uh, from a tool point of view. Things like name badges and uh, <laughs> blue tack and things like that. Um, <clears throat> so I won't talk about those. So anyway, um, just talking about diagnosing problems. Um, uh, and this is uh, the, the first step in diagnosing a problem, whether it's uh, something you're doing for somebody else or, or something you're repairing for yourself, is to consider the history of of uh, how it's gone wrong. Um, uh, did you do something or did, was something done and then the thing immediately stopped working, in which case that leads to a certain class of problems? Or is it something which just failed over time? Or increasingly often we're finding that people bring into the repair cafe something which uh, they, they put in a wardrobe and they got a better one for Christmas uh, and a year or two later they bring it out and think oh, I should sell it on eBay and then they find it doesn't work anymore. Uh, and so they bring it along to a repair cafe and say, you know, um, can this be fixed or should I just throw it away? Um, uh, and that gives a different set of problems, things that have got stuck and things where time has uh, <clears throat> done its damage and so on. Um, one of the, uh, the simplest things in the repair toolkit, um, uh, which you, you will of course have uh, seen, is a can of freezer. Um, oh, there we go, can of freezer. Which, which camera am I showing it at? I don't know, there we go. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, uh, and uh, what, what's the purpose of a can of freezer? It, it's not just to give you frostbite. Uh, it is uh, really handy for doing quick diagnosis of complicated problems, particularly in bits of electronics. Um, you find that uh, if you've got a problem which takes uh, a minute or two to appear after something turns on, um, or is intermittent, you can be fairly certain that it's going to be some kind of thermal effect. Um, and um, uh, going around your faulty piece of kit and uh, spraying each individual component in turn 
particularly those that are getting warm, um, very often the thing will suddenly come back to life. Um, or in terms of you may have to reboot it and it will then come back to life. But really without any detailed understanding of what's going on inside this complicated bit of electronics, you can very quickly home in on, uh, on a, a particular fault. So a can of freezer is an extremely useful tool um, and um, I, I would strongly recommend that, uh, that uh, you, you make the most of that. Uh, the, the next thing which I've got here, um, I have to confess, is, isn't actually in the, uh, the, the toolkit at all, but I've just ordered one and there will be one in the toolkit. Um, I don't know whether you've seen this on, on eBay, um, but you can buy one of these little things for about £15. Um, and it, it's very good at identifying components. Um, uh, I'll just show you it working. Um, here we go, plug in a capacitor, press the button, um, and uh, if you give it a moment, uh, you may just be able to see, uh, if I look at it, hold it up to the camera, where are we, there we go. Uh, you can see that it's, it's identified what it was. And what's really good about this is with some test leads that you've got here, you, you can do in-circuit testing as well. Obviously in-circuit testing affects what you, um, what, what you measure, um, but you can be pretty sure that if you uh, put this tester across a capacitor in your circuit that's meant to be a, a big one like uh, this one I've got here, and it says 40 second, 47 picofarads or something like that, you can be pretty confident that that capacitor is open circuit. Likewise, if you've got some low value resistor and you put the tester across it and you get some very high resistance value, you can be pretty sure that resistor is open circuit and, and so on. Um, and um, I mean, th this thing is really, I know Mark Irving who's on the call is an enthusiast for this. Um, it's called, called a component tester um, and uh, I, I think uh, if you go onto eBay there's, there's quite a lot of people who offer it. Um, it's amazing you can put in just about any semiconductor and it will tell you what it is. Um, I just picked one at random here uh, and you can see probably, there we go, that this is a MOSFET. Um, and it tells you the pin out immediately, so you don't need to go and get a data sheet. Um, and uh, here's something different, plug that in. Um, and uh, let's see what this is. I can't remember what this is. Oh, there we go, it's a triac, and so on. So really, really amazing. And um, for, for 15 pounds, it will save you so much wasted time. It'll save you even going to have to print the data sheet out for a semiconductor, because you can just find out what the pin out is just by pressing the button on this thing. So that's very, very well spent money uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, the, the ones which are available now on eBay, they have a rechargeable battery and built-in test leads and all kinds of clever stuff. So uh, 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 a really good tip and uh, I thoroughly recommend that. Um, anyway, let's talk about cleaning a bit. Um, okay, all the usual things are in the toolkit for cleaning. Um, things like WD-40. Um, uh, anyone who's got a grandfather will probably know what pipe cleaners are, or, or, or kids who do craft at school for that matter. Uh, and uh, there are plenty of those in there, really handy for cleaning out blocked pipes and things. Um, talking about cleaning, don't forget about keeping yourself clean. Um, there's hand cream in there. Um, put that on your hands before you do anything mucky. Um, uh, and it'll be an awful lot easier to clean your hands afterwards. And there's sachets of Swarfiga in there as well. Um, so that um, yeah, you, can, you can get yourself clean afterwards. Um, uh, <clears throat> a dust remover, there's a can of this. Uh, we go through these quite fast, um, uh, but uh, very useful for getting dust out of bits of kit. Um, uh, if it's run out, uh, or even if it hasn't, there's this old fashioned puffer, which uh, you know, um, uh, photographers used to use, still do use. Um, uh, and that is even more effective than the aerosol actually when it comes to things like um, uh, cleaning the lenses in a, a, a DVD player. Um, okay, so that, that, that's all I wanted to say about cleaning. I should say, should have said before, that um, I, there's a lot of things I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about WD-40 because I think you probably know what it is, but if I'm uh, glossing over something that you really want to expand on. There is time to talk about things. By the way, with WD-40, just a tip, give it time to work. Um, 
you, you, you find that after you know, leaving it for 10 minutes, um, the WD-40 will have got into whatever it is you can't unscrew uh, and it'll be an awful lot easier. Um, anyway, okay, so applying mechanical force. Um, I don't need to tell you about a set of screwdrivers because you've seen all of those. Um, but uh, let me just point out a few unusual screwdrivers which are around. Um, there's a, a, a very comprehensive kit of, uh, of hex bits. Um, where are we? Uh, let's take that off. Um, uh, all sorts of things in here, all kinds of funny things. Try um, uh, three three legged bits and uh, screwdrivers for. Um, uh, I don't know whether you can see this here. Uh, there you go. Uh, for 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 split screws. Um, there's one in there. I don't know what it is, and maybe you can tell me. Um, anyone know what this is for? Tense hex. Is the is the vote? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it turns it hooks, that makes sense. Um, anyway, um, so, uh, so um, also in there, really quite oh. handy, are some really deep hex bits. Um, increasingly, manufacturers are putting their screws down at the bottom of deep, deep holes. Um, and you can't use your regular hex bit uh, in a thing like this because um, obviously uh, the, uh, the chuck gets in the way. So uh, you do occasionally need really deep ones. There aren't, unfortunately, in here some really deep Torx bits. Um, and that's the, uh, that's the latest thing which uh, um, domestic appliance manufacturers are using. Um, and we, we could really do with some of those in the kit. Um, also in there, uh, a set of these screwdrivers. Um, you, uh, I probably did need the microscope uh, to show you what this screwdriver is. Yes. I don't know whether you can see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, these are uh, domed screws with uh, 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 five little tiny lips on them. Um, uh, here's a larger one. Um, and uh, they are absolutely essential if you want to fix something, uh, if you want to fix a Nintendo Wii or anything like that. They are the only things which will do it. Um, uh, and um, smaller Nintendo products um, have the, either this thing um, or this one. And this just looks like a spike, but it isn't actually, it's very slightly oval. And without this, you absolutely cannot get those particular screws out. So there are these really odd ones in there. Um, also a long deep uh, one for split screws. Um, so um, <coughs> you'll find that we, without a screwdriver like that, if you want to take a Nintendo apart, you'll literally need to hacksaw it apart. Um, so um, really, really valuable that we've got those in there. So uh, let me just clear the space for those. Um, what have I got next to talk about? Um, oh yes, gripping. Uh, there is an adjustable vise in there. I don't need to show that to you. You've seen those before. Uh, it's a clamp to the table variety um, rather than a, a vacuum suction one because most of the uh, um, venues that we have for repair cafes have go pack tables that have a lip on the edge um, and a fairly coarse surface and suction just simply doesn't work. Um, self grip wrenches you know all about. Um, uh, if, if you know what a circlip is you'll know that getting circlips uh, off is much easier when you've got a pair of circlip pliers and this pair of circlip pliers that you've got here, oh here we go, I'll put it in front of this camera uh, can you just see that there? Oh, there we go. Um, th th that makes getting circlips off very, very much easier um, and putting them back on again for that matter. Uh, and there's uh, uh, three or four sets of jaws for different styles of circlip, all included in the kit. Um, so, uh, okay, uh, last one in this uh, group. Um, okay, um, I. I I, I'd like you, oh, maybe you saw that. I'd like you to tell me what this is. Opening watches was the vote. <laughs> you saw it. Oh. <laughs> yes, it is. Um, uh, and if you've got a watch like this, this is adjustable. Um, uh, and uh, there you go. Oh, I, can, I can get my watch back off. Um, 
So uh, that, there's, there's one of those in there as well. Um, grabbers, uh, you, you got something down the bottom of a deep hole. Um, there are three of these in there. Um, this particular one um, not only has a grabber on the end, as you can see there, um, but it also has a light. So you can actually see down the bottom of the hole and see what you're grabbing. Um, uh, and uh, if you've got something lost down the hole, that really is much the best way to do it. Let me try and turn that light off. There we go. So another nifty piece of kit. Um, oh, do you have them smaller as well? Um, there, there is a... Uh, well, oh, there's also a magnet grabber. Um, but no, there isn't a really small grabber. Although many of the hex bits are magnetic. Mm. Um, so um, then this thing which I'm just tearing the Velcro on here is uh, an iFixit toolkit. Um, if you're going to be spending any time at all fixing mobile phones or laptops, this is really worth spending a bit of money on. Um, about £29, I think. Um, and uh, if I just talk through what's in there, uh, um, okay, uh, we've got these things, um, which are known as spudgers, um, which are much better than fingernails for getting plastic uh, mouldings apart. Um, just put them in the crack and slide them along. Um, uh, three flavours of uh, tweezers, very, very small tweezers. Um, because most of the screws inside mobile phones are too tiny to pick up. Um, uh, in here, there's an anti-static kit um, and uh, also uh, a sucker, which is absolutely vital uh, for um, getting the screen off a mobile phone. Also works on iPods and uh, you need more than one for an iPad, unfortunately. Um, uh, and Samsung mobile phones are glued as well. Uh, um, and uh, uh, you also need heating for that, unfortunately. So there's some metal um, tools in there as well. You can probably see. There we go. Um, uh, and uh, a very handy um, hex toolkit, um, including some quite unusual bits. There's um, uh, a pentalobe, there's um, uh, Torx bits with holes in, um, and uh, also some sockets for, for nuts, um, and uh, various flavours of uh, Philips and uh, Posi drive as well, um, and uh, also a little tool for uh, pressing things in holes. Um, whoops, comes with um, a standard. Uh, screwdriver, uh, extension bit, um, and also a, a flexible bit um, in case you need to uh, uh, get something around a corner. Um, very, very handy. It's lots and lots of use. So that's the uh, the iFixit toolkit. Do you have an eye opener? Uh, an eye opener? An eye opener. I don't know what an eye opener is apart from something to open your eyes. For iPads? Oh, an iPad opener. Um, uh, no, I'm, I mean, we, I should say the repair cafes don't specialise in, in high-tech. Um, uh, typically, uh, we, we, we find that you know, a repair cafe has to limit itself reasonably to 20 to 40 minutes for a repair, um, because otherwise it's just not fair on everybody else. Um, and that rather restricts what you can do to, to a smartphone or an iPad. Um, also, um, increasingly, uh, you need uh, to heat uh, the uh, surround the screen uh, of a, a smartphone in order to get it apart. Um, and it, it's really a bit difficult to achieve uh, at a repair cafe. Um, we, we tend to leave that to the specialists. There are also uh, restart parties you probably know about. Um, and restart parties tend to have um, higher tech people there 
but we do we do tackle easy tasks on smartphones and and tablets um, uh, uh, and laptops. Um, uh, and this kit has has the basics that you need to do that. But I should say that taking a screen off a, uh, an iPad does require practice. You know, you're likely to ruin a couple of iPads before you get it right. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, it comes with that sort of health warning. Um, so anyway, so that, that's, that's, um, that, that covers um, applying mechanical force to things. Um, just a, a quick word about sharpening. Um, there, are, there are three uh, diamond coated steel plates in there. Uh, this is the modern version of a whetstone. Um, actually work rather better than a whetstone um, and um, they, they work dry, you don't need oil or, or water on them. Um, and um, there, there are three grades here from the finest to the coarsest. And you can do most um, household sharpening tasks with these three plates. Um, <clears throat> either keeping the plate still and moving the blade for small things or for large things like garden shears uh, running the plate along the blade. Um, also one of these is quite handy under the uh, uh, adjustable vise uh, on the edge of a go pack table. <laughs> that isn't designed for that of course. Uh, okay right the next thing to talk about um, uh, a very neat piece of kit and astonishingly good value. Let me just grab it. Now uh, let's see if I can put this in such a way that you can see what's going on here. Um, okay, um, we'll need to look at the display and the close-up camera in a little while. But for the moment, let me just get it plugged in. Um, Now this piece of kit is really three completely different pieces of kit all in the same box. Um, uh, and it's got so much functionality that it's a bit confusing unfortunately. Um, so it, 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 it merits some explanation. Um, so let me just get some of the bits of this out of the way. Um, and we'll concentrate first on the most obvious item I suppose which is the soldering iron. Um, and uh, if I turn it on, um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the panel here is rather confusing. Um, uh, the way uh, it's divided up um, it isn't, I have to say, the most obvious. But I should say that this piece of kit uh, costs £85 um, and you get a fantastic amount for your money for £85. Um, okay, so the soldering iron, um, solder station, let's turn that on. There we go. Um, I currently set it to 400 degrees um, and it's now heating up the soldering iron and uh, it will uh, show you the temperature of the soldering iron. Um, and the little decimal point down the bottom corner shows when the soldering iron is actually heating. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, that's... Um, oh, hold on. No, it's gone wrong again. I had a bit of a problem with this earlier. I should say that at £85, this is not the most reliable piece of kit. But, I mean, crikey, for £85, what do you expect? Um, and uh, it, uh, uh, it has required to be repaired a few times, but, uh, uh, and it's now misbehaving. There we go, let's try it again. No, it is not working. Oh, my apologies. Anyway, the soldering iron, went <laughs> when, when I find the intermittent problem that I thought I had cured, um, uh, will be fixed, and uh, the soldering iron here um, will uh, uh, function as indicated. Um, the second thing is a hot air gun. Um, the hot air gun comes with several different nozzles, including a very small one, for example. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you can turn this on here. And um, okay, it's now putting out hot air currently at 150 degrees. Um, and uh, I can set the temperature here, I can... and so on. It uh, goes up to, I think, about 350. And the fan can be adjusted here. So you can, you can adjust the amount of flow um, 
to, to determine the amount of air you get at the temperature you've requested. Now, more and more we're finding that printed circuits um, uh, require there to be a considerable amount of heat on the printed circuit, not just on the item being soldered. If you try and solder or unsolder a component on a printed circuit just using a soldering iron, you can find it's really, really difficult. And um, uh, my counsel is to heat the area around what you're trying to unsolder to uh, maybe 100, 150 degrees C. Too hot to touch, but uh, not massively hot. Um, uh, and then use the soldering iron on the component that you want in the middle and you'll find that it uh, unsolders very, very much more easily um, than if the rest of the printed circuit board is cold. So the, 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 this, uh, this tool is, is, is really handy for that. Um, it's also really good, of course, for... Um, let me just put it in there and it'll turn itself off in a moment. Um, it's also really handy for things like shrinking heat shrinks leaving, um, curing things that need to be cured, uh, and uh, in general applying heat wherever you need to. <clears throat> um, one of the uh, um, other uh, bits of kit that we've got here um, is, let me just grab it, uh, a multimeter that um, that uh, includes a temperature measurement uh, and actually let, let me in a moment come back to that and I'll, I'll show you how you can actually prove that uh, uh, the uh, uh, workstation is behaving the way it should. Um, the last part of this multifunction tool um, is the power supply. It's a, a, a lab power supply here. I turn this on. Uh, okay, I can see it's now set to uh, uh, 7.3 volts, uh, no current. Um, I can set the voltage to anything that I want um, using uh, coarse and fine adjustments here. That's the fine adjustment, this is the coarse one. Um, goes up to 30 volts. Um, uh, and you can use that to power a piece of kit. Um, if it's got some unusual battery and you think the battery might be flat, you can just power it off this instead. Um, or someone brings something in to be fixed and they've left the lump on the wall power supply at home. Um, no problem. Um, there's a, a variety of connectors. Uh, there's uh, the, the standard barrel connectors here, um, the, the commonest sizes. Um, there's um, uh, uh, USB uh, Type A. There we go. Uh, there's also uh, universal leads um, with, I don't know, you can see all of this selection here. Um, everything from Apple Lightning connectors to uh, uh, Nokia mobile phone connectors, um, old, old iPod style, um, USB-A, USB-C, um, the, the, the whole shebang. Um, and um, uh, so you, you can power a piece of kit um, that, that requires any of these connectors from here. Obviously you need to set the voltage correctly. And if you're using this USB, then, then clearly you ought to uh, make sure that the voltage is 5 volts, as it says. There you go. Um, so really an uh, amazing piece of kit. Of course, you've got just two standard uh, um, alligator clips, crocodile clips as well. Um, so, um, yeah, you should never, never be short of a power supply um, for, for testing a piece of kit. Um, as long as it doesn't need more than 30 volts uh, and about, uh, I think it's about, it says 0 to 5 amps, but it's actually about 4 amps, I think. Um, so, three really good functions for 85 quid, but okay, bear in mind that you might end up having to fix it as well. So, that's, that's the, uh, the surface mount workstation. I should say, uh, by the way, if anyone on this uh, uh, Zoom call uh, is a whiz at surface mount repair. Um, I would just love them to come and make a video of how to use this to uh, to replace surface mount chips really reliably. Um, I'm you, kind you're of having to, you've got some hands up already. <laughs> <laughs> Jolly good. Okay, because uh, uh, surface mount does require a lot of practice. Um, 
we, we, we kind of limit ourselves to about eight pins of surface mount at repair cafes um, uh, and uh, I'd love to know how to do more. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, that, that's the surface mount workstation. Um, very, very versatile piece of kit um, uh, and, and very well used. Um, I was just going to show you, moving that a little bit out of shot, um, that uh, the, the multimeter that is included in the system, uh, I'm sure I don't need to show you multimeters in general, um, but this one has a useful attribute in that uh, it can also take a, uh, a type K thermocouple um, uh, and uh, uh, measure temperature. Uh, and uh, it tells me that we're at 19, 19, 20 degrees in here, 21 degrees even, there you go. Um, uh, and uh, um, if I uh, put it, uh, if I turn the uh, uh, SMD read workstation on, it says that's at 117, oh, there we go. Um, and let's see if it is indeed at 170. Um, oh. Uh, you probably can't see this, let me put that there so you can see it. Um, okay, don't know whether we're getting anywhere near 170. Oh, I'm out of shot. where we can see it. There we go, let's try that. That's better, isn't it? There we go. Mm. And actually, you, you might not think that measuring temperature is that important, but actually, uh, it's quite useful to make sure that things are indeed behaving the way they are. You can test that the soldering iron is at the right temperature. This thing's good up to about 400 degrees. Um, and uh, okay, we're, we're getting up there towards 170. We'll get there in the end. Um, oh yeah, 145. The, 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 uh, the kit, the, the surface mount workstation is not very well calibrated, I have to say. Um, so it wouldn't be surprising if it's going to be different slightly. Uh, Okay, where are we? About 100 and, 150 something. 100 and... So, yes, it looks like it's a bit under temperature, but anyway. Um, so, uh, um, set, setting thermostats, um, uh, calibrating um, temperature systems, really, really useful. That. Um, and actually, I, I use it for measuring temperature surprisingly often. I didn't think I would need to, but it turns out to be really quite a handy thing. Um, let me just take that out of there and put these covers back on. So, okay, so we've talked about um, the surface mount workstation and temperature measurement. Um, and um, <clears throat> um, the next thing I want to show is the, uh, the latest addition to the uh, uh, Repair Cafe Toolkit, which um, many people haven't seen yet. Um, I'll just need to take this out of the way and, uh, and bring it over. There we go. Hopefully that's roughly in shot. Yes it is. Find something to plug it into. Now, you, you may not have come across one of these before. Uh, it's a so-called isolating variac. Um, and what it is, it's a, a variable mains power supply. Um, but uh, the uh, output is completely disconnected from Earth. There's no live and neutral um, because there's no connection to Earth at all. Um, and this is important and valuable because it means that you can touch either output quite safely. So here we are, here, here I have, I think in shot, yeah, um, a, uh, a, a Commodore Garden 
60 watt incandescent light bulb, remember those? Um, and uh, you can perhaps see on the meter that uh, I'm cranking the voltage up. Actually, let me put the, uh, I'll put the light there, you can see it right next to it, can't you? Oh, actually, that, that's less good. Let's, let's, let's leave it like that and you can see the display. Um, okay, so crank it up to, oh, there are 250 volts. Um, and despite the fact that this lamp has 250 volts on it, um, uh, I can touch either of the uh, outputs quite safely. And as long as I don't touch two of them at the same time, um, it's quite safe. So why would you want to use this? Well, if you're fixing something like a toaster um, with lots of exposed contacts inside it, uh, elements and so on, um, it is much, much, much safer to, taste it, to test it on an isolated power supply. Also, if you turn the voltage down to maybe 100 volts, the, uh, the toaster won't get too hot too quickly and won't burn you. Um, so I, I would really like to see everybody who is fixing mains powered domestic appliances using one of these. Um, uh, another application where it's really, really valuable is in, if you're trying to find out what's going wrong with the motor in a vacuum cleaner, you typically end up having to take the motor out of the vacuum cleaner. And now you've got this thing sitting there in your hands and if you want to power it up, first of all, you're in danger of getting a shock from it. But more critically, if you just turn mains on, the motor will twist in your hand and be in danger of breaking your wrist. Um, whereas with a Variac, you can crank the power up very slowly and at 20 or 30 volts, the uh, motor in the uh, vacuum cleaner will be going around at this sort of speed and you can quickly and safely see what the problem is with the motor with absolutely no danger to yourself. Um, so I, I really, really hope that uh, repairers who are working on mains powered appliances in the repair cafes um, uh, use this whenever possible um, because it's much, much safer both from a mechanical point of view and an electrical point of view. Um, so um, uh, I, I'm really quite excited about that um, uh, and I think that uh, um, it will be a real asset. I'm, I'm disappointed that um, this particular isolating variac only shows voltage. It would be just brilliant if it also, as well as having the voltage here, had a, had a, had a, a current display as well. Um, I, ha I have one at home um, which does have the current display display as well, but it's done in a rather different way uh, and unfortunately weighs in at 17 kilos. This one is only about 10 kilos. Um, so it's still quite a hefty lump, but honestly well worth lugging along to a repair cafe. Um, and um, I, I strongly advise you to use it whenever you can um, uh, and be safe. Okay, so um, that, that pretty well covers the, uh, the tools in the toolkit. Um, there are a lot of things I haven't talked about. I haven't talked about Allen keys. I haven't talked about pliers. Um, I haven't talked about the leather punch or anything like that. Um, uh, lots of other good bits in there. A head torch, Stanley knives. You, you know about these things, I think. Um, um, just be aware that they are in there. Um, I should say that <clears throat> um, follow up to this Zoom call, um, Simon will send out to anyone who's interested um, the uh, spreadsheet that contains the uh, Repair Cafe inventory. There's no great proprietary secret about this. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you, you'll probably find all sorts of things in there that, uh, that I haven't mentioned. Um, hopefully are fairly obvious. Junior hacksaw, I think you probably know what a junior hacksaw is. Um, uh, or, or indeed a cordless drill. There's a cordless drill in there, very nice one. Um, provided somebody remembered last time to charge it up after they used it. Um, lots and lots of very good kit. So um, all of the things that I've talked about so far come in the large black and red box that you saw in the picture that we had up at the front uh, at the beginning of this. Um, <clears throat> and that's really where all the tools are. The smaller box which goes on top is the box that contains consumables. Consumables is things like glues and uh, adhesive tape and uh, um, uh, switch cleaner and stuff like that. <clears throat> so, um, 
So let's just talk a little bit about consumables. Um, I, I won't talk much about heat shrink sleeving, which is one of the things in there, because I think you probably know, you, you've seen heat shrink sleeving being shrunk before. No great uh, excitement there. But I will show you something that I, I have done a lot of repairs with, which I think is a useful trick. Um, <clears throat> so let me get this out of the way um, and, and just bring something else over to show you. tools I didn't find before. Let me just find those. Uh, I can. There we go. Um. Okay, now what I'm going to show you here is, is how to, to join wires. Um, this is really a very, very common requirement. Um, <clears throat> anyone who's got a puppy has probably experienced a puppy chewing through a cable. Hopefully it didn't electrocute itself in the process. Um, <clears throat> cables get jammed in doorways. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, ha having to repair a broken lead is a very, very common thing. Um, I should say also that I have taken a certain amount of flack for this because people say, well, it's not safe, it's not approved. But I have to say that I've been doing this for a very long time and I have never, ever um, had any uh, kickback about it being an issue. Um, but, you know, it comes with a health warning that uh, you, you need to be a bit, a bit careful. I'll, I'll explain what you need to be careful about in a moment. Um, so, oops, there we go. Um, so, strip a piece of wire. Uh, let, let, let's, let's say we're going to join the two ends of this piece of cable together. Um, right, let me just strip a little bit more than that. Um, Okay, so in order to join two wires together, this is the way I do it. I have some copper tube in various sizes. Um, you can buy this from modelling shops. Um, it comes in sort of foot lengths and it doesn't cost very much. Um, find a bit of tube of the right size uh, to do the job. This one looks like it's about the right size. Um, to cut the tube, you need to uh, Roll it with a Stanley knife. You can't cut it uh, with a pair of wire cutters because you'll crimp the end if you do that. So roll it. There we go. Oop, and it goes on the floor. And now you put the two bits of wire in to your short length of copper tube. Try and make sure you get all the strands inside. There we go. And get a pair of side cutters like these and squeeze. Not so hard that you cut everything, but hard enough to grip. And it takes a little bit of practice to get the grip right. Okay, so now I don't know whether you can see that there. Um, we've now got <clears throat> three crimps on that tube. Um, actually, I know it's a little bit too long here. and put the other end, the other wire in that I'm going to join it to. Oh, hold on. I crimped it a bit clumsily there. I need to make sure that I haven't squeezed the end. There we go. That's better. And put the other end wire in. Crimp the other end. Okay, so there we go, that's the finished join. No soldering involved. Um, and uh, really a very important step is then you must subject it to as much tension, I'm pulling it quite hard now, um, as it's likely to possibly suffer in use to make sure that you've gripped the wires really, really thoroughly. And if you pull hard enough and it comes out, okay, scrap it and start all over again. Okay, obviously, <laughs> I'm sure you all made this mistake. Before you do this, you need to have put some heat shrink sleeve on the wire. 
and uh, when, when you've made this join then pull the heat shrink sleeving over the join uh, and, uh, uh, and shrink it. Um, do the same for the other two wires if it's a three core flex um, uh, and obviously you need a piece of heat shrink sleeving over the whole lot as well um, uh, and you will have then joined your piece of flex. Um, as I say, um, s some electricians throw their hands up in horror at this, but uh, uh, I, I leave you to, to judge for yourself. As I say, I've done it certainly hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times, and I've never had a, a report of any problems. So uh, um, that's why there's some copper tube in the, uh, in the kit. Um, but obviously, uh, it comes, there's several sizes. Do choose the right size um, for, for the wires. Uh, that you're going to to join. Uh, okay, uh, crimps. Um, there, there's a complete set of crimps in the toolkit. Um, and uh, where have I got my crimps? Here we go. They're over there. Crimps come in two flavours. Um, there are insulated and uninsulated crimps. Um, and, um, oh, there we go. Um, un uninsulated crimps are important for high temperature applications. You often find these in, in toasters and things like that. Here's, here's an uninsulated crimp. Um, uh, the insulated variety looks like this. And uh, the, the crimps are colour coded. Um, the, the uninsulated ones aren't colour coded, but the insulated ones are. These these are the red ones are good for wires up to uh, one uh, square millimetre. The uh, the the blue ones are good for uh, 1.5 square millimetres up to 2.5 square millimetres. Uh, and the yellow ones are for um, four and six square millimetre wires um, and do use the right size. Um, let me just show you, I mean, I think probably you know how to do a crimp, but I'll show you how to do it anyway. Um, let's cut a piece of wire here, strip it. Um, uh, oops, need a bit more than that. There we go, here's a stripped wire. Um, and uh, this wire is, um, I think it's about one millimetre. Let's see if we can fit it into a, uh, a red crimp. If it will go in, then great. If it won't go in, then we will need to go to a blue crimp. That will go in. Okay. Um, so now uh, there, there are two sets of crimp pliers in the toolkit. Uh, the blue handled pair is for insulated crimps. This is an insulated crimp. The, uh, the red handled pair is for uninsulated crimps. So as you can see perhaps here, the, uh, the, the uh, insulated crimp, uh, crimp tool is color coded, yellow, blue and red. This is a red crimp. So uh, we put the uh, red crimp, you need to make sure you get this the right way around. Uh, and this goes that way around. And we squeeze. Oh. oh, no we don't. It has to be right open. And then squeeze down. Oh, hold on. Got that twisted. This way around. Hope you can see what I'm doing. Uh, and then squeeze until the tool self-releases, which comes there. No, there. There you go. And when the tool self-releases, then you know that the crimp has been um, properly pressed. And really important, do a physical check to make sure that it's tight. Uh, and indeed, this one is tight. Okay. Crimping is, is, is really important and popular uh, as a means of terminating cables. Um, actually, it's more effective, if done properly, than soldering. Um, but if you crimp loosely. If you don't, go right the way to the point where the tool self-releases. So right down to 
one more, there you go. If you don't go right the way, then uh, the crimp isn't going to be secure. The uh, uninsulated crimps are a little bit different. Let me show you doing an uninsulated crimp. Oh. Okay, the uninsulated crimp goes into the crimp tool. Again, uh, you can see there's various different sizes here. They're written on. Um, this is the smallest size, I think. Yes, it is. Uh, uh, no, it isn't. It's the second smallest size. And it's going to go... I think it will only go in one way. Uh, you'll see, by the way, on the crimp that there are two stages of crimp here. Uh, this bit uh, is the bit that actually makes the connection. This bit at the end is the bit that, uh, that grips the insulation. So what we want to end up with is the wire sitting like that with the, uh, the insulation firmly gripped uh, in the, the second stage of the crimp. So let's get this into the tool. Make sure I get it all in the right way around, which is a bit fiddly. Um, actually, it needs to be in that one. There we go. Right, I don't know whether you can see this. I've got the crimp gripped in the tool. I'm just holding it hand tight. Uh, get the wire put in. There we go. And then I'm going to need to put quite a lot of force on this. Actually, I've made the insulation a bit too long here. Let's cut that, get that right. Let's try again. Uh, oh, and uh, now this has come out. There we go. Squeeze that. This takes a certain amount of practice, but it's really valuable and good to get it right. And if you're ever going to be doing a professional job, then you need to know how to do it. Right, so here we go. We're just about going to squeeze. And it's now waiting to self-release. I've got to squeeze it more, more, more. I'm putting quite a lot of force on this now. And there it goes. And you can see that uh, this is the finished result. I don't know if we can see that there. There we go. You can see that the, uh, the top crimp is gripping the insulation uh, and the uh, smaller crimp is gripping the conductors. And the net result is something which is really tight. You can really pull it hard and it'll be fine. Um, <clears throat> so, as I say, there's a full set of crimps in, in the, uh, the toolbox, all the commonest sizes. Um, th th this is what's called a fast-on, um, which g goes on to a spade. Uh, a spade looks like, let's see if I've got a spade in here. Oh yeah, here, here, here's a spade. So uh, that, 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 that's what the, the fast-on goes on to, like that, or, or the, like that for that matter. Um, so, so there's these fast-ons. There's, there's spades in there of various sizes. Oh, there we go. Oh, I'm not quite focused. Oh, come on, focus for me. There you go. That's the spade. Uh, there's also um, open and closed eyelets. Um, there, there's an open eyelet. Um, uh, and there's a closed one, a rather larger closed one. Um, uh, but all, all the crimps I've shown you so far are uh, 250 crimps because they're 0.25 of an inch across the flat. Um, there's also 180 crimps here which are rather smaller. Surprise, surprise, they're one, uh, 0.18 of an inch across the flat. Um, you'll come across both sizes very commonly in domestic appliances. Um, and um, it, it's really useful to be able to, to replace those um, and as I say, the kit is all here to do that and to do it professionally. So that's crimps for you. Hope this is all useful um, and that uh, I'm 
not to teaching your grandmother how to suck eggs, as they say. Um, th these are all things which I've picked up over time. Um, and uh, I'm apol apologising if it's all old hat to you. But um, anyway. Um, other things which you'll find in the consumables, which I haven't mentioned. Um, uh, things like nylon ties, fuses, uh, some batteries. There are some batteries in there. Um, uh, there are batteries for testing things, which may or may not be new. Um, and there are some new batteries which you can sell to people and just leave some money in the toolkit. A um, couple of other things to mention. Um, oh, I was going to show you my mobile phone. Um, let me just go and get my... Oh, no, I, I, I want a different mobile phone. I want my mobile phone for reasons which will become apparent. Um, um, one of the things which uh, uh, there's plenty of in the toolkit is some stuff called Sugru. I don't know whether you come across this. Um, it, uh, it's uh, a bit like um, sort of putty stuff. It comes in various colours. It comes in tiny little sachets like this. Um, some, here's some yellow and some red. Um, there isn't a blue one in here because I've used the blue. And I'll show you what it's really good for. It's good for things like this. I've put shock absorbers on the corners of my mobile phone. It's saved my mobile phone many times um, because this stuff goes into springy, hard plastic um, uh, when it sets. It takes an hour or two to set. It goes off quite quickly. Um, as soon as you open one of these packets, it starts to go, um, and, and you get about 20 minutes to shape it to whatever shape you want. Then leave it for an hour, uh, and it will be um, uh, it, uh, a solid bit of plastic. And um, really useful for mending things where you know, you've lost a bit of plastic um, or you need, uh, as in this case, you need some kind of shock absorber on the corner of your plastic. Um, re really, really neat solution for that. And there's plenty of sugru in the box. In fact, I'd be glad if you used it because it is going to go off. Um, if I look at this one, it says used by 2nd of April 2017. Ah, so um, <laughs> it might be that this has gone off already. But actually, if the packet's sealed, there's a good chance that it hasn't. So that's Sugru. Uh, another thing to mention is this stuff, Loctite. Uh, if you've ever taken a screw out of a laptop, you'll notice that there's a little bit of blue stuff in the thread. Um, and they put this in there to stop the screws shaking loose. And that stuff is Loctite. It's not like conventional glue, um, but just put a blob of this on the thread before you screw a screw in. Um, and the screw will not shake loose. Um, really, really handy. Uh, if you've got anything which is subject to vibration, you know, like, I don't know, uh, you know a, a screw on or a, a bolt on a bicycle, um, anything subject to vibration, put some of this on, uh, just a dab of it on the screw before you screw it in, um, and uh, it won't shake loose. So, um, yeah, not like conventional glue at all, um, but really very, very effective. Uh, so there we go, that's Sugru. What else do we talk about? Oh yes, uh, well that, that, that pretty much covers the consumables that I wanted to talk about. Um, and uh, well, we, we're just over the hour, so that's hopefully I can <laughs> keep going for a few more minutes. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the other things I wanted to talk about were the spares which are in the uh, the Repair Cafe Toolkit, um, uh, some of which might be a bit unusual and unfamiliar to you, um, and some of which might surprise you. Um, one of the things which is in there is, is uh, safety capacitors. Um, it's, it's worthwhile making a little study of this. Um, safety capacitors um, are, are for going across the mains, um, and uh, uh, here's a typical one, it says 100 nanofarads, which is quite a common sort of value. Uh, and you probably can't see it on here, but it says that the, uh, uh, the uh, working voltage is 275 volts AC. Now, uh, why do I put these capacitors in there? There's, there's thousands of other capacitors you could put in the repair toolkit, um, uh, and it's not possible to put every flavour of capacitor in there. But safety capacitors do crop up again and again and again. Um, they, these are capacitors put across the mains, 
um, or between the mains and earth. Uh, and uh, they, they come in two safety flavours. The, these aren't just regular capacitors, they, they have to be um, tested very stringently because um, uh, if they're across the mains then uh, there, there's potentially lots of power that could go through them uh, and if they're between the mains and uh, exposed metal work then if they go short circuit they could electrocute you. So they're very rigorously tested. Um, they, the, the two flavours of testing are X1 and X2 and Y1 and Y2. Um, uh, the, the one figure is for industrial use and you don't come across that very often. The, the, the two figure uh, is much more common. Uh, X2 is for going across the mains um, uh, and the uh, capacitors which are in the kit are X2 capacitors. Um, and the usual scenario in which these are needed is uh, someone brings in a sewing machine or a, a food mixer or someone and says, oh, suddenly there was a bang and smoke came out of it. Um, uh, and uh, it's quite dramatic and typically they come in some panic. Um, but what's happened is that this capacitor has failed, um, gone short circuit. Um, uh, uh, and uh, usually when you look inside, you'll see a capacitor a bit similar to this and the, uh, the damage will be very obvious. Um, and uh, uh, so you can replace that capacitor quite safely with another one of a similar value um, uh, and uh, then your food mixer or, or your sewing machine will be as good as new. Um, and uh, these, these capacitors typically last 20 or 30 years so uh, you get a lot of 20 and 30 year old sewing machines and food mixers and uh, uh, things like that that come in with these blown capacitors. Um, very, very, very common problem. Um, so, so that's really? the. Really, got a question. Yeah. Go ahead. I can't hear. Can I hear? Yeah. Hang on. Let me uh, let me just uh, put you on the speaker. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Um, yes, yeah, th these are definitely safety capacitors, not starter capacitors. Um, uh, I should say that, yes, large motors uh, typically have a, a starter capacitor associated with them. Some number of microfarads, as you say, it's some number of hundreds of volts. Um, and um, uh, no, there is not a replacement capacitor in here to try it with, but the multimeter can measure capacitance. So, I, uh, and indeed, so can this little thing. The, 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 this little thing which I showed you earlier, this is good up to um, more than one millifarad, which is unbelievable. Um, but uh, you, you can absolutely measure your, set, your starter capacitor with this, or, or with the multimeter, and um, prove that, uh, that that is the problem. The, the typical symptom, by the way, of a, a failed motor starter capacitor is the motor either runs very slowly or it doesn't go around at all, it just hums. Um, uh, and uh, yes, that is an increasingly common problem as well. Uh, yes, I know, but the last one I had, when I want to show that behavior, it, uh, I actually replaced the capacitor for it being cheaper than a new motor, but it turned out it was a blown winding on the motor, so it was there. Ah, okay. Uh, that, 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 that's a, a, a trickier issue. Um, I would uh, expect to be able to do a continuity test on the winding of the motor um, uh, and see that it's some small number of ohms. Um, uh, if, if the motor um, is, is winding is high impedance, then yes, absolutely, that's the problem. But I think... It, it, oh, I see what you mean, yes, okay. Um, well, um, that, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, my, my question to you would be, okay, if we're going to put a starter motor capacitor in the repair toolkit for this purpose, what value should it have? For common household appliances, 50 microfarad, 400 volts. 5-0. 5-0, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, well, we can certainly consider that. Uh, it doesn't weigh too much. <laughs> we can add it to the kit. <laughs> I might have a spare. Oh, okay. Well, um, 
We're happy to receive donations into the kit. <laughs> but thank you, yes, a good point. Um, okay, so where were we? Um, oh yes, a few other unusual um, components. Um, one of the uh, uh, travesties of uh, modern domestic appliances is the inclusion of thermal fuses which is a very, very common thing to do for safety. It's a good safety move because it means that uh, power stops flowing if something overheats. Um, here, here are a selection of uh, thermal fuses. There's quite a variety of them here. Um, they, they come in a, a sort of tubular form. Um, here are some in a tubular form. Uh, some of them are also rectangular. Here's some rectangular ones. Um, uh, they, uh, they have uh, two key parameters apart from the size. Uh, one is the temperature at which they trip um, uh, and the other is the maximum current they can take. Um, and uh, of course um, the, uh, the te temperature at which they can tri trip is quite critical. Um, so is the current. So uh, you, you do need to match them up reasonably well. If you put in, replace a thermal fuse with one of a lower temperature then uh, uh, it, it, it may fail in normal use, which would be a nuisance. Uh, if you put in too high a temperature, it may then not fail in the event of a fault, uh, which might be really dangerous. Um, so there's a good selection of thermal fuses in here, various current ratings, various temperature ratings, they're all in there. Um, but uh, it's a very obvious point. If you're going to replace a thermal fuse, um, be very, very careful if you're going to solder the ends because the chances are you'll trip the thermal fuse. Um, and you may want to use my uh, crimped copper tube solution for putting your thermal fuse in, um, in preference to soldering to avoid that possibility. Um, but uh, thermal fuses, again, very, very commonly blow. As you know, if you've got a hair dryer and you you, you put a hand over the uh, air intake and count to 10, you will have blown the thermal fuse and unless you know how to replace it, your hairdryer is a write-off. So a good selection of thermal fuses, they're not expensive to buy um, uh, and a lot cheaper than buying yourself a new hairdryer. You also find them commonly in electric blankets, uh, hair curlers particularly, um, <coughs> um, anything else which heats really. Um, another perhaps surprising component, uh, do we, contain, do we uh, include every possible semiconductor? Of course we can't possibly do that, um, but we do include some of these. The, this is a, a 600 volt, 6 amp triac, uh, very very common, um, uh, typically appear in light dimmers, uh, speed controls for food mixers. Um, uh, the, the, the light dimmer that has a floor switch for an uplighter. Um, all, all, all of these things, very, very common for speed control and lighting control. Um, and um, if you get a, a light bulb that blows, it's quite easy for the light bulb to, uh, to also blow the, the triac. So, uh, but one word of warning about this, the, the, these trikes are non-insulated tab. Uh, the tab is connected to MT2, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, and so don't replace uh, a trike that's like this with an insulated tab with one that's with an uninsulated tab because it will be dangerous. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, somewhere I've got... Uh, Where's that thing I was talking to you about before, Simon? Oh, I can't see oh, it. Ah, the, the, the magic box. Yeah, the magic, the little magic box. Uh, there's another one here somewhere. Okay. Oh, okay. No, sorry. Okay. Um, does anyone care to suggest what this is? Very, very common in houses now. Any ideas? No ideas. <laughs> You've stumped everyone. Have you noticed how many table lamps, particularly bedside lamps, now have 
a touch on, touch off feature. There's no longer a mechanical <laughs> switch. Uh, well, it's all based on a module like this. Uh, they're not all this size and shape, but most of them are. Um, uh, and uh, basically, you know, they, they have a red and a black which go to the mains, uh, and the black and the white go to the light, and the yellow with this great big eyelet on it um, uh, is attached to the exposed metalwork on the uh, uh, on the lamp. Um, inside here, uh, there's a, a few components, but uh, th these these come from China. Uh, there you go. That's what there is inside. Um, uh, and uh, this little thing here is a trike that switches. And uh, if you have a light bulb that uh, that fails and goes short circuit, even momentarily, it will blow this, uh, and you'll need to replace it. Um, I bought these from China. They were a pound and a few pennies each. Uh, and there's absolutely no way that one could buy the components to make that in this country. There, there's, you can just about see in the picture, there's detail on the, uh, on the box about how to fit it. Um, and these are quite common now in table lamps. Um, uh, and so there are a couple in there um, that, that can be used. Um, there, there's an awful lot of things that you can buy really cheaply from China um, that, uh, that are really worthwhile to have in a kit. Um, Here's another example. Um, oh, there we go. Um, what is this? This is a selection of replacement drive belts for cassette players. Uh, and there's, oh, 20 different sizes in here. Um, there must be at least 50 um, drive belts of, of those different sizes. And the whole lot cost me £1.80, including postage from China. Oh, it's insane, isn't it? But, uh, you know, so many people have been so grateful to have one of these to fix an old cassette recorder. Uh, because all of the drive belts in old cassette recorders by now have gone soft. Um, so, uh, anyway, th there are some of those in there as well. Um, uh, what else have we got? Uh, there's also, of course, there's, there's scraps of wire in there. There's all sorts of different kinds of screws of various kinds. Um, uh, and all those kinds of things that you, you're always bound to need for, for, for doing repairs. Um, re really, the, the last thing to mention is that um, in the repair kit as well, not in the main toolbox, but in um, uh, one of the admin boxes, uh, there's one of these. Uh, this is uh, a pretty decent um, Android tablet. So. If you're at a, a venue which has Wi-Fi um, and you haven't brought your laptop, then you can use this one here um, uh, to, it's, it's on Wi-Fi, you'll need to register it obviously on the, uh, uh, on the Wi-Fi of the venue that you're at, uh, but you can then use it to browse the internet and find the data sheet for, uh, for, for whatever it is you're trying to repair, or even watch the YouTube video of how to do it. Um, and in case you think that we were rather wanton spending money on these, um, uh, we were very generously donated 15 of these Android tablets. Um, uh, 12 of them had bulging lithium batteries and were disposed of very carefully, <coughs> but three of them were good. Um, uh, and so this one is included in the toolbox uh, and I hold two spares. I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, uh, but I'm very happy to take any questions from anybody. Excellent stuff. So, uh, shall I, uh, yeah, let me turn the microphone, uh, the speaker on, and we'll see if anyone's got any questions. Hope everyone enjoyed that. It's done, do, we have any, do we have any questions <laughs> on, the, uh, on the line? Sorry, what was that? There's was something about MOSFETs and... I say triads are not, us not usually used anymore, uh, not that much, but LED technology and modern motor controls and uh, things, it's usually MOSFETs these days, so um, uh, is that going to be addressed? Um, 
Well, I, I think I would say in response to that that uh, you know, here we are responding to what comes in um, uh, uh, and we've seen again and again that these 600 volt 6 amp triacs are what are going. Um, maybe the reasons why we don't use them anymore is because they kept going. But people have a lot of kit uh, that does have them in and they have blown. Um, I think uh, if we went down the line of starting to stock MOSFETs to put in, um, in, in uh, as replacements, uh, there are an awful lot of parameters that we would have to match up. Um, and I could imagine having, you know, a hundred different kinds of MOSFET in the repair cafe and still not have the right one. Any other questions? Um... Actually, just, just to comment on that too, one of the disasters that's happened to us, um, and maybe to you as well, is that HGs in Mill Road burned down. Um, uh, and uh, we used to send people along there for whatever we didn't have. Um, and if they needed a particular MOSFET, we'd tell them the part number and say, come back to the next repair cafe, um, having gone down to HG and got one. Well, you're, you're very welcome at any point to dig through Makespace's uh, trove. Oh, well, there's a It's full of all sorts of uh, <laughs> components. But uh, yeah, so you consider that an open offer whenever you want. Thank you. Any, any last questions before we wrap up? We're just coming up to the hour, so I think we'll... One more question, if there is one. Is there any plan to... Uh recording an excellent presentation I thoroughly enjoyed it but I'm thinking that it could be useful to pass to other people so yeah Glenn that's that's our plan yep so hopefully this is uh, um, recorded well and um, we'll make sure it's published so uh, you can share it as much as you want Brilliant. But, but also just to bring up yeah excellent presentation oh, Chris. Th it was thank really, you. really brilliant. thank you so, uh, <laughs> Thanks on behalf of everyone uh, You're very who, who joined. Yeah. Should we, should we end it there? Yeah, well, that's no, great. Uh, okay. happy. And, and if you have any more um, uh, questions, um, I'm sure uh, I'll, yeah, I'll provide yeah. ways for people to follow up because uh, yeah, happy to I follow up. We're yeah. very interested in supporting you guys however yeah. we can. And if you're not a member of the Repair Cafe community and you fancy coming along and making yourself really useful and having a really rewarding Saturday or Sunday, then do come along <laughs> as soon as we can. <laughs> All right. Th thank you, everyone, for joining. Not yet, but... <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank Thanks you for joining. Nice. And, uh... Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Simon. Really good. Thank You're very you. welcome. <laughs> we'll see you later. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.